Good afternoon. I'm Emmett Kelly. I'm a member of the CMC Board of Trustees, also a member on the Homeport Board of Trustees and a partner at the law firm of Frost Brown Todd. Uh, it's great to see everyone here today. <clears throat> Our forum series, Pulling at the Roots of Poverty, is brought to us with support from National Church Residences. And today's chapter, Housing as a Vaccine, is brought to us with support from Ohio Capital Corporation for Housing, Habitat for Humanity Mid-Ohio, Cardinal Health, Casto, and Enterprise Community Partners. Please help me thank all of our sponsors and welcome Vice President and Ohio Market Leader for Enterprise Community Partners, Mark McDermott, to the stage to introduce our speakers, please. Thank you, Emmett, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. You're all done, right? Is there a dessert coming? I'm your dessert. Uh, it's my pleasure to represent Enterprise Community Partners as we support the mission of the Columbus Metropolitan Club to engage people and ideas in community conversation. Uh, if you indulge me for uh, one minute, Enterprise Community Partners uh, believes that opportunity begins when people have a safe, healthy, and affordable place to call home, somewhere to go back to every night. But in communities across the U.S. and right here in Ohio, rents are rising, wages are stagnating, and working families are having a harder time to find decent housing that they can afford. In fact, on any given night in this country, more than 600,000 people sleep either on the streets or in shelters. And nearly 19 million low-income families pay more than half their monthly income on housing. It's about 11 million renter households and 9 million owner households pay more than half their income in on housing. And in fact, in Ohio, that nearly 400,000 of those families are housing insecure. Nearly one out of four renters in Ohio living right here are paying at least half their income on rent. If you could just stop and imagine that for a minute. Nearly one out of four renters paying half their income on rent. What do they have left after that for everything else? So Enterprise uh, nationally has set a goal to end housing insecurity in the United States. But to achieve this goal, we need to partner. So we will work with the newly formed and already very strong Affordable Housing Alliance of Central Ohio, the National Make Room Campaign, and with partners like all of you in the room today. We're also proud to follow leaders like Dr. Sandel, who highlights the critical intersection of affordable housing an opportunity for a better life, and helps us all understand that housing is a foundation for positive growth, for vibrant neighborhoods, and for economic prosperity. With that, I'd like you to please welcome on the stage today the CEO of Habitat for Humanity, Mid-Ohio, E.J. Thomas, our host and reporter for Columbus Business First, Carrie Ghosh, and starting us off, our honored guest today, author, medical doctor, associate professor of pediatrics at the Boston University School of Medicine, and Enterprise Community Partners board member, Dr. Megan Sandell. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm really excited to be here today. This is actually part of a two-day uh, tour that I've been doing. I had a great breakfast this morning with local CEOs and got to tour uh, some of the great work that's happening on the South Side with Nationwide Children's Hospital staff. And I'm going to be heading over to City Council after this and then giving a talk tonight at Ohio State University. In the morning, I give the grand rounds at Nationwide Children's Hospital and then head up to the State House to do another, uh, another visit. So I have earned my my keep over these last two days, in the next two days. Um, so uh, as a doctor, what I will often say is, is that I learn the most by listening and thinking uh, about what my patients tell me. 
And so one of the clinics that I do in Boston, we call the GROW Clinic, and it's a clinic for treating failure to thrive kids. And obviously the word failure to thrive is pretty bad, so we call it the GROW Clinic instead. And for uh, the parents in the audience, right, when we think about failure to thrive, we know that kids are growing on a growth curve, right? And when they start slipping off that curve, we start getting concerned. And the kids that we treat at the GROW Clinic are an inch off of that curve, right? They, they're so far off the curve, they meet the uh, criteria that the World Health Organization lays out as malnutrition. And those kids live in the city of Boston, and, and we treat them. And I often think back to one of the patients that I've, I've treated there. And this was uh, a little boy named David, who was two years old, but was really the size of a one-year-old. He hadn't outgrown his 12-month-old clothes yet. And I was tearing my hair out trying to get this kid to grow. I was throwing medicine at him to help stimulate his appetite. I was giving him Pediasure supplements in order to try and get more calories. I was running all these blood tests to check for metabolic problems and allergies, and I just couldn't get him to grow. And then something changed. His mom and he got an affordable apartment, and they no longer had to sleep in the living rooms of various family members as they had over the last year. And so that for me, it was this amazing moment where this kid who was kind of walking but not very well started to run. And he started to talk. And he started to speak in little sentences. And he got back on that curve. After flatlining, he was getting back to where he was supposed to be. His body and brain were growing. And so because of patients like David, I think of housing as a vaccine. It's something that's going to keep you healthy now and in the future. And more and more, there's evidence that supports that idea, right? Stable housing matters. Uh, I work with a research policy network called Children's Health Watch. And we started looking at this idea of kind of this continuum, right, where homelessness is at one end of a spectrum, stable housing as, is at another. But there's a lot of people who live in between. And so that we have found in our research that if you move two or more times in a year, you look about as bad on health outcomes as homeless families do in terms of hospitalizations, developmental delays, being underweight or stunted growth. Um, I think decent homes matter. And I think it's easy for people to make that connection that no amount of medicine is going to help an asthmatic kid be able to breathe easier if they're going home to a moldy home. And new research really ties to the fact that not only is it bad for your physical health, but it's bad for your emotional health. How you do in school may be tied to the housing quality. And then I think it's really important to say that affordable housing matters. Again, from our Children's Health Watch research, we looked at families that were receiving a housing subsidy versus those that were eligible but sitting on a waiting list. And we looked at the subset of families that were food insecure. The families that got the housing subsidy were twofold less likely to be stunted as a result of their food insecurity. So that housing subsidy was like a vaccine protecting you against multiple threats. But I think it's important. I don't want to act like housing is the only thing that matters. But I'm going to argue that everything else that you want to do to address poverty, you have to talk about housing first, that it's the first in a series of vaccines that are going to be needed. So I think that it's really important to talk about public education. Education is the key to a future. But what I'll tell you is that in many public schools, there is a huge amount of a churn rate where Kids start the school in one district and may finish the school in another district. Um, Dr. Kelly Kelleher from Nationwide Children's Hospital is telling me they were trying to do an educational intervention in one of the schools near the hospital, and 28% of the kids weren't there after a year. And that's not an uncommon finding that housing insecurity leads to that, that churn rate, that leads to chronic absenteeism. And so I, I think it's great to do educational interventions, but I don't know how you do it if the kids don't show up to school or they don't stay long enough to benefit. I think the other thing is safety is really important, but there's huge data that suggests that that neighborhoods that are residentially unstable, that, that have people coming and going, are much more likely to have higher rates of crime. And then finally, we talk about decent jobs. And you have a really great economy right now. You have a booming economy. People are trying to seek um, more and more uh, employees. But 
When we talk about the churn rate in public schools, I want to think about the churn rate of employees, right? When you have to travel large places in order to get to your jobs, that has a cost to it in terms of hiring and firing and training and other things. And so when we think about it, it starts with housing. Help people have stable, decent, affordable homes so that all your other interventions then can be more effective. I'm really excited to come to Columbus today because I feel like Columbus as a metropolitan area is really starting to think not only about housing as a vaccine, but it's talking about stocking that pharmacy, right? It's talking about ways in which we can really try and address this issue. I think that in many ways, there's not only the usual suspects like banks or foundations or other things, but you've got healthcare institutions like Nationwide Children's. You've got educational institutions like Ohio State University. I was at a CEO breakfast. There were 45 people that stayed the entire hour and a half. I had to shut it down because I had to get to my next thing. And that was really a sign that people wanted to get, roll up their sleeves, as they said to me later, the Columbus way, right, was that you want to try and solve problems and make that work. Um, one thing that doesn't uh, always make it onto my bio is that though I uh, grew up in Boston, I have some Ohio roots. My dad uh, is from Finley, Ohio, and so I spent summers as a child in Finley. And so uh, friends of mine will say that they don't believe I'm from Boston because I actually look people in the eye and ask them how they are. Um, <laughs> and, and so that uh, I think that uh, when I think about Ohio, I often remember a, a story where I was visiting my grandmother when I was applying to medical school. And so I flew into Columbus. We had a really great weekend. And then she was driving me to Cleveland for my Case Western interview. And we got lost, right? And I'll never forget that my grandmother, she just pulled over to a gas station. She rolled down the window. She put out her hand. And that's all she did. And not one, but two people walked over to make sure that she was OK. What did she need? And that confidence that, that the community was going to help her, even if it wasn't her community, that, that she was going to be helped because she was in need. And I think that in many ways, when we think about this problem, I think the evidence is really clear that we need to strengthen and build affordable housing, and that that is going to benefit us all, and that we really need to feel like there's an urgent need to address this now and it is solvable. We can set those metrics and we can move it forward. And I'm really excited about kind of continuing the conversation and then opening up to listening to you all about how we can make that happen. Thank you. All righty. So um, <clears throat> may or may not know I, I cover uh, healthcare from the business side, so might be having a little Admiral Stockdale moment. Why am I here? So, um, but I would, I would have you know that uh, in, in, back in my 20s in Michigan, before children consumed all waking hours, I actually volunteered for Habitat for Humanity. And there were two years, I took a full week of vacation to participate in housing blitzes. I got very good at uh, siding and shingles, but I do not do drywall. So, um, <laughs> wait, wait till the kids are big. And get back, get them out there. Uh, so, the uh, first question I wanted to ask Dr. Sandel is: you, you, had, you had mentioned at lunch that there there are even 1911 dated papers saying how you know housing is essential for healthcare. So, when you're bringing this out, do you ever encounter? resistance to the idea, or is, it, is, is there ever a response of, well, yes, we understand that's a problem. We are just not doing anything about it. Yeah, yeah I think, um, uh, so Carrie asked me at, at lunchtime a little bit around, is, is this a new problem, a, a new idea? And what I said was, no, I, I can actually um, show you the, the paper that says housing and health from 1911 from public health reports, right? And I think that even those from the public health field, when we talk about kind of Jon Snow discovering kind of the idea of you know when the people in London stayed in London during the summertime and got cholera, it was related to where they lived, right? That mattered to what their health was. And I think that in a lot of ways, what I'll say is housing has always mattered to health from the, you know, the time of the caveman and on. What that challenge has meant has changed, right? So when we talk about decent water or we talk about um, fire safety, right? Like you read that paper from public health reports in 1911, and they're talking about 
about um, tuberculosis, and they're talking about fire risk. Because at that point, that was the problem in the tenements. There was no natural light. The tuberculosis um, uh, bacteria were really rampant, and they were huge fire risks. And so we've solved some of those problems, right? When you think about kind of housing code and how we put that in place for safety or other things, we've solved that. And what we now have is a new challenge, which is particularly the affordable housing gap, right? When we talk about one in four renters having to pay more than 50% of their take-home income, that is our new housing and health challenge. And I think that for me, what happens is because that, particularly that challenge around affordability is, is such a personal challenge, people don't talk about it enough. And so that I think that when we talk about homelessness, that connection gets made really easily. But homelessness is the part of the iceberg you can see, right? There's a lot of iceberg below the surface. And, and when we think about it, the Affordable Housing Alliance estimates there's 54,000 families in the metropolitan area. There are about 1,500 that are homeless, but 54,000 that are that part of that iceberg below the surface. And so part of it to me is once you help people make the connection, their blinders are off. They're going to see it all the time, how housing impacts health care, schools, jobs, other things. But it's really about taking those blinders off so that we can really engage in the conversation about how we're going to solve this problem. All right. uh, so twice we've heard about the Affordable Housing Alliance of Central Ohio, and you might be thinking, well, what is that? Is this new? And yes, it is new. Uh, it's a group of 11 separate uh, nonprofits, uh, including the sponsor today, National Church Residences and Habitat, and uh, we can list them all off. But um, they are coming together to unite their disparate messages for different constituencies. And setting a goal uh, sounds like a pretty ambitious goal of filling that gap of 54,000 affordable units at a pace of 2,700 either new builds or rehabs a year. And so EJ, if you could tell us more about that initiative. Well, thank you. Uh, everyone in this room knows that we have uh, a housing issue for low-income folks uh, and affordable housing for folks in general. And so about a year ago, our groups all came together, uh, all of us concerned with housing issues, but all of us doing something different in the marketplace. And what we did was we plotted them on a line and we've got a continuum there that goes all the way from homelessness to market rate home ownership. So we formed this group, um, as Doug Kreidler said this morning, we, put our, we, we left our swords at the door and all decided to work together. And, and one of the reasons was because we need to advocate more effectively for what it is that's needed out in this community across all the disparate lines that exist. And right now, when you go to talk to policymakers who are all generalists by, uh, almost by definition, it, it's, uh, it's like uh, having uh, 11 folks in the church choir all singing a different song from the same hymnal, but they're singing all at the same time. Now, you tell me what kind of a song you're going to hear. It's going to be tough to make heads or tails out of that. So what we have decided to do is to come together in an integrated fashion and work from one end of that continuum to the other in order to very succinctly lay out for policymakers where the needs are in all of these different areas so that pulling together our policymakers, pulling together the folks who are leaders in this community, pulling together our nonprofit organizations, we can all start to develop ideas where we can take steps in a more uh, concerted way to get to the point where we can develop the houses and the housing solutions that are needed. Now, not all of these need to be sticks and bricks from, from foundation to roof. If you take, for instance, a housing solution that's needed for someone who is elderly and wants to age in place, but they need, for instance, a handicap accessible bathroom. That may be the only thing that's keeping them from being able to stay in their home. So if we can provide one of those 2,700 a year housing solutions that allows them to age in place, is that not better for them? Is that not better for us? So that's why we're all pretty excited. I know it sounds like I've had way too much caffeine today. <laughs> and, and by the way, we're trying to figure out how to get Megan's flight canceled because she's doing such a great job advocating for us. We're just going to keep her here. Welcome back. All right. Um, give us a, a sense of the scale, just how ambitious this is. 2,700 a year. Uh, collectively, uh, 
your individual organizations, what's the current rate of units per year? If you look out there in the marketplace, the estimate is three to 400 are coming online as affordable housing solutions, whether they're rental or whatever, uh, and for the, for the markets that we all serve. So um, this is very ambitious. But if you look at the need from a variety of different angles, I think that we have the opportunity through advocacy to open some eyes that it's not necessarily intuitive. For instance, if you're a business owner out here and you're struggling to get folks to work in your business, it's really handy as a recruiting tool to have a place for them that's affordable that they can stay. And without that, they may seek out someplace else to live and work. So. Um, there's a, there's, a, there's a lot of benefit that comes from this. Uh, if you look at, you've all had Psych 101, uh, the hierarchy of needs. The bottom block is you gotta have enough to eat and drink. The second block is you need to have a place to stay. If you don't have a place to stay, nothing above that is gonna make much sense. You're not gonna put much effort into it. Your stress level and the incidence of mental health issues for you uh, are gonna go up. So by addressing the housing solution, we will lessen the need for social services in many other areas. I, I believe that speaks to your point. Yeah. So I mean, th there's not much difference between developing an affordable housing unit versus you know, what's going up in uh, New Albany today. Uh, you know, there's no terrazzo floors, but it costs a lot of money. Uh, you know, I see Jim Sweeney over here, and he has explained in the Franklinton Development Association, uh, about eight houses a year, they, they'll acquire a property for 20,000, spend you know, 100,000 to 150,000 rebuilding something new from the ground up, they can only sell it for 80. So how, how, where's the money going to come from? Well, as where the money has been coming from for the number of houses that have been built, it's no secret that in the, in the world of business, if you're in a neighborhood where the houses are going to appraise, a new home is going to appraise for 100,000 and it costs you 140 to build it, if you're a for-profit builder, you're not going to build there because you can stay home and break even. Why do something where you're gonna lose money? So for those of us that are in the business as nonprofits, many times through the efforts of Jim out there in Franklin, good to see you, uh, and others, at the point, there comes a point where you get to a critical mass of the number of homes that you've developed where you're raising the comps so that a for-profit developer says, you know what, homes there now are selling for more. I think I can go in there, build a home. We saw that happen in Franklinton years ago, and we'll continue to see that other places. And this is all part of, this, this is like a huge jigsaw puzzle that's sitting in the box waiting for all of us to come together. And I know that sounds kumbaya, but what I'm talking about are the members of the Alliance, uh, the nonprofit community, uh, our business leaders, our policy makers, all sitting around the puzzle table and start laying this all out. Uh, because as it has been, as individual groups, we've been grabbing a handful of puzzle pieces out of the box and trying to put something together that doesn't work well. Uh, Oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say, it, it's interesting because I do a lot of talking around the country, so this is not an unusual question in some ways, right? Like, how do we pay for this? You know, doesn't this cost more money, you know, subsidizing a building of affordable housing? And I always want to kind of turn the question a little bit around. When we say that, you know, can we afford to do that, my question is, can you afford not to, right? Like, this is about the health of the region in many ways, and so that you are blessed with a booming economy, but if people can't afford to live here, that's eventually going to become a problem and that's a problem not only now but that's a problem for your workforce for the future where you talk about kids and how mobile they are with different neighborhoods and so when I when people talk about the costs affiliated with it I always ask are you adding up the ways you're paying for the lack of affordable housing already right you're paying for it with higher health care costs you're paying for it in terms of more uh, investments in uh, having to fight crime you're in, in you're paying for it in terms of special education costs and so when we start adding that up especially in certain populations like the chronically homeless you'll save money by actually aligning the housing and health services together Right? Denver looked at this, they save $15,000 a year per person. So you can actually do it better and save money. And so I really want to kind of 
challenge the group. This is where you're gonna roll up your sleeves and you're gonna think about what are the ways in which we can unlock resources now, recognizing it's an investment, but recognizing that it will pay off when you do it to the right scale. And so the other, you know, I, I love my medical analogies, right? I talk about the housing vaccine and the first of many vaccines. I want you to also think about dose matters, right? So to solve this problem, to see the community level benefits you wanna see, you wanna do it at a certain dose. You don't wanna just pick a house or two in a given neighborhood. You wanna take like a block by block approach in how you're going to invest and be able to make that better. And I think that's where you're gonna see that investment pay off and see those long-term cost savings. Uh, you mentioned Denver, are there, are there other communities where you've seen an effort like this and what has worked there? Yeah, so it's really interesting. I think that more and more, there are really nice examples of where instead of taking like a piecemeal approach, you're taking a much more coordinated approach. Um, one example is Seattle, right? So Seattle King County has looked at um, not only taking its healthcare institutions, for those that don't realize, healthcare institutions that are nonprofits need to do what are called community health needs assessments on a regular basis. And that it drives theoretically the community benefit that they they are trying to do commiserate with what they would be paying in taxes if they were a for-profit. And so what Seattle King County did was they got together and they did one community health needs assessment for the entire county. And they didn't, instead of having you know, 10 or 12 different hospitals do their own. And then what they also did was they came together with different sectors, you know, health, public health, housing, and they created a coordinated plan. So instead of it being different voices in the choir, they had a sing everybody reading from the same kind of hymnal with the same song. And so I really think that when you think about that, that helped them unlock a levy so that they're able to now create new funding streams for affordable housing because they had everyone together making a plan and then building the consensus that they needed to invest in this. When we uh, talk about, you know, there's 11 members of this, and you know, we I asked, you know, is Franklinton development part of it? And not yet. Um, but so, how do you grow the group with other organizations also in your choir? And then, do you ever look at it and say, why are we 11 different organizations? Uh, is there any opportunity for you know not uniting only in message, but in administrative and, and other uh, structures? Which of those questions would you like me to answer first? <laughs> all of them. Um, well, first of all, we, we want to be inclusionary. Our 11 members came together uh, as just a small group. Hey, what do you think of this idea? Do you think this is something where we might be able to gain some traction? Does it make sense to roll this out? We're gonna have cynics out there. They're gonna say this will never work because you folks are so different, which goes to another part of your your question, and that is I think because we are so different and the, the funding streams that are coming to us now are so specific um, as it relates to grant uh, requirements and the compliance issues, I think it would be difficult to just throw everybody into the same box. Specifically, be, and for another reason, because we're, we're working on different parts of that continuum. So I think that it makes sense for us to be our own folks in the room, but it clearly will be an advantage to our overall effort to expand our membership, to pull in others who are working in these areas uh, who are also trying to solve housing, housing problems. Was that responsive to your question? Questions? Yeah. I, okay. I think I'll also say, what I've noticed around the country is that the, the municipalities that really try and tackle this don't view it as a one-size-fits-all solution, right? So they're thinking about it as, you know, there may be need to be innovations in the elder space. There may need to be different innovations in the supportive housing space. There may be different innovations in the family space. And also, really are starting to think more and more about short-term, long-term, right? So there clearly is gonna to need to be a lot of building and rehabbing of units to get at this gulf of need. And yet, there also may be ways that you help families quickly through a rental subsidy program that just helps them not have to make those tough trade-offs between am I gonna heat my house today, buy food for my kids, 
and pay the rent, right? And so that when we think about that, there may be ways in which you can think in a lot of different solutions. And so having different people attack different parts makes more, the most sense than necessarily one big behemoth. There's also, uh, in our group, there's a rich base of skill sets uh, that are unique, I think, to each organization. And so for us to be working together allows us to learn from each other. I can't tell you the, the, the really good stuff that I picked up on as a function of being part of this group. Um, so that's a shout out to, to the team. And I think another reason why you want to make sure that you have separate voices that are working together. Just like a choir. You got bass, you got alto. <laughs> Nobody sings the same string of notes. They, they keep me. Uh in the pews. Um, so <laughs> in a few minutes, uh, you'll all get your chance uh, to uh, ask some questions. Uh, but uh, we have one final question, maybe make a little bit of trouble, which is, uh, you, as you know, that there are pockets of declining housing throughout Columbus that line up really well with the pockets of infant mortality. And you know, to your point, but those pockets of declining housing didn't happen by accident. There were, you know, from the 1930s, there was redlining, you know, through, you know, not too long ago, about, I looked up about two thirds of Columbus deeds had restrictive covenants of this property shall not be sold to an African American family, although they didn't use that terminology. Um, we have in the 2000s, the disastrous uh, subprime lending crisis, and a lot of this is, is tied to, to racial uh, prejudice. And so when you are taking your case to the policymakers, to the corporations, to the for-profit builders, to what extent does the idea of restorative justice come into your uh, persuasion? I found the Columbus community to be pretty open to try and fix things that might have been broken years ago. But we start someplace. That's certainly a, an issue that will be part of future discussions, I'm sure. So, Doctor. yeah, so I, in some ways it's interesting. I, I heard that um, one of the lunchtime talks you guys had was with um, the Kerwin Institute, which talked about the maps, right, the opportunity maps. And for those that haven't checked them out, they're really important because I think you're right. When you map what opportunity looks like, in the um, metropolitan Columbus area, and you show the yellow, bright yellow is the low opportunity neighborhoods, and then you've got the really dark red, um, high opportunity neighborhoods. Those map pretty well to the hot spots of infant mortality, say, as one example. And so for me, I do think that oftentimes we have described neighborhood and housing as being um, very much in this negative context. And I will say that having done a lot of community engagement work in the Boston area, um, uh, one of my friends leads an initiative uh, there called Vital Village Network, um, uh, led by Renee Boynton Jarrett. And what, what first community say is they don't want to hear about all the bad statistics, right? They don't want to hear that they're the diabetes hotspot of the world, right? They don't want to hear that they want to talk about um, uh, opportunity and assets. So that's, I think, a really important thing to talk about is that these, um, and I think that this is, again, I'm going to say Columbus has really tried to start to invest in this United Way, um, neighbor, Neighborhood Leadership Academies. Some of this is, um, uh, again, Nationwide Children's Hospitals funding some innovations where neighborhood leaders get together and decide on ways to improve their neighborhoods and provide seed funding for that. And so that I want to say that there's this important idea about place that also has to talk about people, right? And that these neighborhoods have been systematically disinvested in. And therefore, when we talk about reinvesting in these communities, community engagement, investing in people is going to be as important as place. And then before we open it up to questions, so y'all get your questions ready, we're going to open up the mics, is um, I want to talk just very briefly about this concept of equality versus equity, OK? so. If you can kind of follow my uh, my uh, hand waving here, so if you picture kind of three different heighted people, right, that are trying to reach the apple on the apple tree, 
And one's a lot closer than, say, the other two, and there's someone that's a lot shorter that's going to be harder to reach. If you treat all of those people the same, equally, you give them each a little box to stand on, the person who's taller is going to reach the apple with just that little box. But the other two people, you're just per perpetuating the difference between those three different heighted people. You're not actually closing the gap, making it easier for them to reach the apple. And so the concept of equity is that you make a different sized box for the people that are shorter so that they can reach the apple, right? And so when we talk about these neighborhoods that are quote unquote the same neighborhoods that have this um, kind of lower levels of opportunity, I want to really start talking about equity investing in those communities so that they can be all the opportunity neighborhoods and, and really talking about cumulative opportunity in that way. And that's going to be both about investing in people in place. And I think that we typically talk about housing as something devoid of the neighborhood of where it is. And I think we need to really talk about them together and really be able to talk about equity and opportunity with a lot more fluency. All righty. It is the CMC's tradition to take audience questions. So if you could step to the microphones, there's one, that, is there one on that side or just one on this side? Uh, step to that microphone. <laughs> uh, please give us your name and then ask your question. Thank you in advance for not making a long editorial comment so we can get to everyone. Oh, go. Yeah, I'm sorry. I was waiting uh, for you to ask. <laughs> yeah. My name is Rory Krupp, and I'm a historic preservation consultant. My question is uh, about the recent Supreme Court decision and HUD, and uh, how is that going to affect the local housing market yeah. and the placement of affordable housing? All right, so it's always dangerous to have the pediatrician giving legal opinions or housing finance decisions. So I'm going to give that caveat right from the get-go. Um, so it's really interesting. So uh, I think, as it was disclosed, I am on the board of Enterprise Community Partners. And um, I really like one of the blogs that was written by our, one of our vice presidents for advocacy, Diane Yentel. Um, and really, I think, uh, for those that are less familiar or, um, around this, is that the um, uh, the Supreme Court came down with a decision stating that where affordable housing gets placed needs to um, uh, consider where that housing is located in order to further fair housing law and therefore where opportunity is. Because what typically happens is, is it's cheaper to build affordable housing in more distressed neighborhoods. And so that typically is where more affordable housing gets placed. And the, the, um, the, uh, the people who typically give out the um, tax credits that support the building of affordable housing, there was community groups that actually sued them saying that they weren't furthering the fair housing laws by, by allowing affordable housing to be built in these distressed neighborhoods. And so what my feeling is is that it is not about or, it's about and, right? And so that there is a lot of research around moving families from distressed neighborhoods to opportunity neighborhoods. That experiment was literally called Moving to Opportunity, which was conducted in the 1990s, where 5,000 families in five different cities were randomized to one of three groups, where they could either stay in the typically distressed public housing that they were in in this distressed neighborhood. They were randomized to get a voucher that would allow them to move to whatever apartment they wanted, but typically without restrictions, they often would choose to rent an apartment in that same neighborhood, often because of sometimes some um, discrimination in terms of whether they could actually get the other apartments, or they were randomized to a group where they got that voucher. That voucher could only be used in a neighborhood of higher level opportunity, and they were given some housing search and social services in order to make that available. And my feeling on it is that when you look at that research, it is kind of a glasses half full, glasses half empty amount of research. There's um, some research that um, suggests that it was really beneficial, particularly to, say, the women of these, particularly women-headed households. This was a paper published in the New England Journal of Medicine by Jens Ludwig in 2011, where they reduced the amount of morbid obesity by 15 to 20 percent. They reduced the rate of diabetes by about 15 to 20 percent. And what I tell you is that if there was a drug that did that, it would be on every pharmacy in this country, right? Like, it was a housing intervention that had a health benefit to that point. But the flip side is, is the Ron Kessler um, published in JAMA last year that when you looked at the long-term effects of the 
boys and girls when they were teenagers after being moved, there is some suggestion that there is um, uh, a increase in the boys of uh, mental health issues and behavioral problems. And so that in particularly that, that higher income or going to that opportunity neighborhood. And so, and then there's also the Raj Chetty work, which is looking at the longer you are in a neighborhood of opportunity, particularly from a young age, your earning potential goes up. So clearly we know opportunity um, neighborhoods matter, and yet how do you achieve getting to them? Do you achieve them by giving people vouchers to go and move to them? That has its pros and its cons, as I just reviewed. Or do you invest in neighborhoods and not view it just as affordable housing, like I'm putting it in this distressed neighborhood and that one development magically is gonna make the neighborhood better? Or do I double down on really investing in that neighborhood? And I will admit, I view it as an and. I think we should be doing both. And I also think that we have to get a lot more serious about how we do community development and view it as dose matters. We don't typically put enough dose in it and we magically ex expect it to work. I do think examples like Southside um, uh, and Wineland Park um, are really good examples of where you're investing a lot of dose and I think you're gonna see a lot of benefit. Right. Sorry, the oh, I don't have researcher in front, of my, uh, in front of my name so it's gonna be tough to top that, oh, but sorry. very good. Okay. Do we have another question? Yes, my name is Kermit Whitfield. Uh, my question is related to what you were just talking about. Um, there's been a lot of talk uh, recently about workforce housing uh, in Columbus. Uh, as we've seen, the number of units go uh, very high uh, in the uh, core city area. And I'm just wondering, how does workforce housing fit into your new uh, coalition? Well, workforce is clearly one, uh, an issue that, we've, that I've spoken to here previously. Uh, at this luncheon, and it's something that will be one of those puzzle pieces that we will be moving around, uh, especially as we pull uh, business leaders and policymakers into the mix. Hi, I'm Meg Tiford from Village Connections. Um, I was glad, EJ, that you mentioned about um, older adults and um, bathrooms that work for them, but I guess my observation is that a lot of new housing isn't very accessible, particularly on the outside. Um, if you can't get in and out of the house safely, you can't live there, and so I'm just hoping that this coalition will look at those questions as well. Sure, that's something that we as Habitat have been very involved in with uh, zero step entries and uh, making sure that the entire house is accessible. So uh, that's something that as our population, just the way the demographics are working as it continues to age, uh, it's something that we're given a lot of thought to. Good afternoon, my name is Michelle Mills. I want to uh, first thank the question being raised in terms of the impact of housing as it relates to race and the impact in certain neighborhoods. Um, my particular concern is the neighborhood of London. My question though today is when you look at strategies such as economic integration, when you look at neighborhood revitalization, economic integration and affordable housing, of those two strategies, which would you say has a greater impact on stability and improvement indexes for, as it relates to health and other factors related to families and children's overall well-being because those two strategies are happening at the same time when you revitalize a the neighborhood there's also economic integration that's happening and then at the same time there's improvement of housing affordability of those two strategies coming together is there any thought that one of the two has more of an impact on children's welfare and their better outcomes as relates to infant mortality and some of those other issues related to their overall health? No, I, I think it's a great question. I think that um, I'm gonna still say it really starts with housing first. And the reason I bring that up is, is that what we have seen more and more is that typically the job growth, and I think that there was a uh, article in the paper, I believe, this past week around the jobs that are typically um, being added to the workforce right now aren't necessarily jobs that make it a, you able to 
to pay a market rent easily, right? And so when we start thinking about what it means around economic um, revitalization, I do think that we want to think about ways in which we can create a stable place for people that they can stay, live, not have to commute long distances. We, we haven't talked about transportation, which I realize is another challenge in the, the Columbus metropolitan area, because when we think about places in which you can kind of work, live, and play in the same neighborhood, being able to, to achieve that. That being said, I do think when we think about really some of the cool innovations you guys are planning here in Columbus around building workforce housing, but not only workforce housing and the fact that it has mixed income, right? Extremely low income, more like 50 to 100% of the area meaning income and then market rent, but also putting on site job training, right? Putting on site places in which you can invest, thinking about as employers, how do I invest in the neighborhood so that my employees can buy some of the homes? Can I cross subsidize some of that for them so that they can become anchor families in neighborhoods and people can get to know each other? And so that I do think that when we talk about economic revitalization, I often will say that it is as much of a benefit from housing as just kind of stable, decent, affordable, that those are ways in which you can give someone that base of which they can now get more training, they can get their kid to school, they can be able to work up the ladder. And so it's, I don't want to say it's an or, I actually think it's an and, but I think it really starts with housing. And I think being able to take advantage of opportunities that are out there, uh, they're much clearer on the horizon when you have a stable place to stay. Without that, it's a very cloudy world out there. Mr. Rush. Good afternoon. My name is John Rush. Uh, first, I'd like to affirm EJ and all of those that are part of the alliance. It's a wonderful idea and look forward to seeing how things materialize over the next few months and years. Um, my question is I work in the reentry space quite a bit and I'm really focused on providing employment for those who have had some challenges in their past. Uh, Darnell is an example. Thankfully, Darnell had an aunt that was supportive and was able to provide housing for him once he re-entered. He was referred to Clean Turn uh, from the Alvis House, has been with us for now almost three years. He's one of uh, a couple of hundred of individuals who have had some challenges uh, getting back into, the, um, back into society, um, but others have had a lot more challenges, especially with respect to finding affordable housing. So I would appreciate you to comment a little bit on the nature of the challenges for our audience, not necessarily a lot of individuals in the reentry space, um, potential solutions uh, as we think about affordable housing specifically for those that are returning from incarceration. Thanks. Yeah, it's something we've talked a lot about in Boston just because for those that, that don't realize, a lot of affordable housing has restrictions attached to it so that you have to do, say, criminal background checks before you rent to people and so that it actually disincentivizes families to taking in a family member who has been involved in the criminal justice system. And so that um, we've had a, a whole discussion about kind of ban the box and doing that both for employment but then also thinking about ways in which you can do that for affordable housing. I think that um, for us, one of the most effective tools we had to trying to engage on that was some of it is federal funding streams where you don't have control of it, but creating local funding streams where you can make that um, more available and therefore not have to have those requirements. And then the other piece that um, we've talked a lot about is just the child health benefits of having a father involved in their lives. Um, there's really good evidence that having father involvement, whether it be um, uh, certainly financial, but also really um, child development wise, being involved in meals, being involved in, in child care, there's really good evidence that that matters. And so really trying to make this a, as a kind of initiative around how do we encourage fathers to be fathers and that has a dual generational benefit. We have time for one last question. Yeah. My name is John Edgar. I run Community Development for All People, one of the 11 groups in the Alliance. Uh, there's been a lot of talk in the community in general, but also today, about there's a big gap and it seems expensive to how to uh, fill that. At the same time, what's intrigued me so much about uh, Dr. Sandow, what you say, is when you talk about this as a vaccine, because in general, the idea of a vaccine is you pay something up front that's not as expensive as treating the disease over time. And so is that part of what you mean? And can you give an illustration about how housing as a vaccine actually is money up front 
that saves a lot in the long run. Is that true? Yeah. 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 Uh, so he's a plant. No, just kidding. Um, uh, so I think. So. Um, <laughs> So yes, Reverend Edgar, I think that that's, um, no, I think, <laughs> so it is really interesting. So when I talk about housing as a vaccine, I do think that we as a society understand that immunization has multiple benefits. And so uh, for those that are interested, I'll go into much deeper depth of this at Ohio State at the Knowlton uh, School of Architecture tonight. But I speak of it in a couple different ways. So we vaccinate healthcare staff, right, like me, like they hound me to make sure I get my flu vaccine. Now part of that is to make sure I show up to work, right, that I'm not sick, but it actually is so I don't give flu to my patients, right? Like we vaccinate kids in elementary schools because we want kids to be healthy, but we also do it because their grandparents are then less likely to die from flu. Like that's been shown, that when you vaccinate kind of people who come in regular contact with vulnerable populations, you actually will save lives, right? And then when we talk about this cost idea, we regularly make cost decisions for vaccines that are on the societal benefit level, not the individual benefit level, right? So chickenpox vaccine is a great example of this. So I was not vaccinated against chickenpox, but all three of my children were. When you look at the pure healthcare cost savings related to chickenpox vaccine, it actually doesn't pay off, right? You know, you only, it costs you like $2 kind of for every dollar you spend in terms of saving healthcare. But when you add in the lost work, it flips so that for every dollar you spend on a chickenpox vaccine, you save $5 societally. That's why your kids get vaccinated against chickenpox, not necessarily because a health insurer wants to save the money. It's because they recognize the societal benefit and that's how they think about it. And so when I think about kind of, um, housing, there's really good evidence that if a kid doesn't stay on track developmentally, they don't show up to learn in, say, in kindergarten. And what I will tell you is that kids who are moving two or more times in a year are much more likely to be developmentally delayed. They don't show up ready to kindergarten, and that means that they're more likely to, say, be retained, that to have to, to add an extra year to their schooling. That costs most school districts an extra $10,000. Right? So when we start thinking about what the cost of this is, it's real, you're paying for it now. And there are ways in which we can start to think on the societal level instead of always thinking on the individual level and worrying about those costs. Thanks. Turning it back over to you. Thank you. Sounds like we uh, need to continue to roll up our sleeves. Constant theme. Uh, I hope you enjoyed today's forum. Uh, we encourage you to continue the conversation outside with coffee and cookies. And remember that you can view and share uh, the forums on CTV Columbus Television, on WOSU and PBS affiliates statewide, the Ohio Channel, and anytime on CMC's website via YouTube. Uh, let's thank our sponsors, National Church Residences, Ohio Capital Corporation for Housing, Habitat for Humanity Mid-Ohio, Casto and Enterprise Community Partners, and also let's thank our speakers, Megan Sandell, E.J. Thomas and Carrie Ghosh from Business First, thank you. And thanks to all of you. I hope to see you at another CMC forum very soon. Thank you.